so the, uh, the first thing I want to show is that, um, um, so we managed to put the video of last week's lecture up on, up on the web on, on, uh, 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 through iTunes U. And so it's been kind of confusing. So, I, so I'm not sure if every way you try and find it, you can get to the video, but I'll show you one way how to get there. And if anyone else has had success other ways, they can, you know, that's great also. Right. Uh, um, I'd like to know if there are other easier ways. But you, you start by going to itunesu.utah.edu. I think I sent an email out about this. Then you click on, on here, you log in, and then it opens up my iTunes, uh, and, then, and then it's the nicely named class uh, 2013 Spring Computer Science 59 and 55, and it keeps going. So it's, it doesn't say data mining for some reason, but um, you click on here, and then I might not subscribe because it may download everything on your computer, which might be a lot. Um, but then Something under the mouse where it says video. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's that's good. Uh, I should say that. Let me try and make this. So, that, so then, what should happen is that if you there should. There should be, you can subscribe to you get the tracks. Uh, there should be some things down here at the bottom where you can, you can click and you can view the videos. And, and probably what's happening is that it doesn't want me to show them because then you'd be recording them and I would somehow break some copyright or something. I don't know what it is. Um, but if, if you click here, so hopefully if you go here on your computer, you can or anywhere you, you have iTunes or something, you can get to the tracks if you want to watch them. Um, so I'm not sure yet you know, if this is useful or not. So um, you know, I'll ask you again during the course of the semester if you find that this posting online is useful or not. Um, yeah. Uh, so, well, we try to get. Okay, so um, please uh, uh, please try that on your own and, and see if it works. Um, and it looks like the, we didn't have the top quality, so it looks like the quality is okay. But if it's not good enough, um, you should um, you should let me know. Um, let's see. So the other thing is I posted the first homework, um, which will be in this link right here. It's due January thirtieth. Um, and so this is the homework assignment. Um, so, so after today, you will have all the material you, you need to do the homework assignment. Um, so it'll be on basically the lecture on Monday and the one today. Um, and so, is it, is it, uh, um, so the lectures are pretty technical, but the point of me doing this is to give you an understanding of these principles and then the homework you will actually be experimenting with these principles. You won't have to um, derive too much of the, the statistics and mathematics. Um, there's a bonus question at the end, which is is meant to be is, is meant to be a bit trickier. Um, and here, you know, in order to do this one, you'll have to actually understand and and uh, um, um, do some of the derivations here. Um, and it's it's only worth two points, so it's the, but these points can you can you need to work hard to get above 100%. So 
Um, it's all, homework's only worth 20 points total, but you can get 22 if you do the bonus. Um, um, so, so hopefully if, you're, if you want more of a challenge, then the bonus question will offer that. So it's, it's mainly doing experimental things. And so if you have questions, post them on the, on the group. Um, and so our thing is if you haven't seen, I mentioned this, if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, you can get to this, this, this Google group. Um, not everyone has signed up yet. The easiest way is if you try and request to be a part of the group, and then it's very easy for me to, um, to just uh, approve, your, approve your membership. Um, and you can change your settings so you either get directly an email coming from that, or you can uh, um, you know, have to go and check or get like a digest once a day or something like that. Um, okay. Um, um, great. Oh, and so then if you haven't seen the notes online, um, the notes I'm posting are, are more technical than what I'm going over in class as well. They're kind of trying to fill in some of the details. So I'll try and, I'll, I'll be able to get much more intuition and illustrate better applications in class, but the technical details and some maybe more proofs or something will be in the notes in case you want. Um, all right. Um, so that's all I wanted to show on there, I think. Small mistake in how I did the 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 exact derivation of the of the was it of the um, um, birthday paradox, and so let me just uh, um, correct this quickly. So the um, the the probability that um, there's a collision after K um, say steps. Um, this is going to be equal to one minus um, what is it? Uh, n minus one over n times n minus two over n. You know, you just multiply these together until you get n minus k over over n. Um, and so there are only k minus one of these. The, the first person has zero chance of a collision. And then, so this is the chance of a collision for the third person after the first two people did not have a collision. So if there's a collision with the first two people, it would have occurred here. Right, so that's how this is accounted for. Um, so is this, and so there's a little bit of an explanation in the, in the notes, which have been updated online as well. Um, so if people, if people have, have, have questions or you see mistakes in class, please um, stop being correct. So it's better if you ask questions. If you have questions, most surely someone else does as well. Um, okay. Um, so then, let's see, just to quickly um, um, recap what we did. Last time we had this domain of these n of these n objects and we're um, you know what what we're doing is we're drawing um, um, a random item uh, um, from this domain and then we repeat and so we, we looked at um, first the birthday. Um, the birthday paradox, which is uh, the um, which is the number of trials um, um, until we have a collision, right? So that's where we've drawn something from here twice, and this happened. 
after about um, um, was about two square root n, right? So after about two square root n trials, uh, um, that's when you had a collision. And then the second thing we looked at was um, the coupon collectors. And this is the number of trials until you've collected all of the items. You've seen every item at least once. Um, um, number of trials until we've, we've seen all. And this we needed a close to um, n times the natural log. Okay, right? And, and there are some extra constants that was in there, but it's about n log n. Right? So this is kind of a paradox because it's not close to n, it's only square root n, which when n is large is, is really a lot smaller. It takes about 23 people to get uh, uh, 23 people in a room where until about half the time two people have the same birthday. And it takes an extra log n factor until you see all of them. So collecting the last coupon takes about an extra n trials just, just to get the last one. Um, so as you fewer coupons left to collect, it's harder to get new ones. Um, um, so, but what this looked like was that we had um, a set of these buckets, and these could be all of the, you know, all of the days of the year, all the months of the year, and what we saw is that you know, it, it, I forget what which date was, which month of the year was popular. Maybe it was April, all right? And before we even had some one person in the room with a January birthday, we had you know about seven people with April birthdays, right? And so what you got is a distribution which is not very even. You have you have a lot of these April events without very many or any of the January events. And so we were talking about how if you wanted to um, kind of model your, some distribution you have, maybe of all your customers, and you wanted to do this by drawing some random set of these customers. You wanted to collect everyone within some sort of category. And so you could hit all the categories of, so, so if, if you have all, we said something about all these nice, um, um, all nice categories with probability, let's say some epsilon. So epsilon is a probability, it's between 0 and 1, um, not let it be 0, and then we need about k 1 over epsilon times this log 1 over epsilon of these trials um, before we we hit all the cat, all the nice categories, and and so if I get to time and end today, I'll define this was based on the VC dimension, and I'll I'll define formally the VC dimension and by time and end today, um, what this means. Um, so what we could so this meant this is how many trials we need to hit all of them. So now the right the, the next question is we want to have about the same number in every category, right? So if you're trying to understand your, your profile of your customers by sampling them. And you happen to sample this, and you wanted to offer, say, um, some, um, you want to offer like a special deal, and people tend to go out on their birthday, right? So you have a special deal in April. Well, maybe this is just a, just a bad sample, right? Maybe just as many people are going out to dinner in January, but you didn't have any of these people in your survey, or you only had one. So you disproportionately estimate the sample, right? So, you, so instead of saying something about birthdays, which is some category you understand, it may be some category which you which you learn from this sample of your customers. And so, the, this I, I'm using this example of samples of customers, but these these big kind of web companies that are able to put ads on on websites actually do stuff like this. So, um, this. Uh, um, so back when I was a grad student, I did an internship at um, Yahoo Labs, and and they actually get they they siphon off like one percent of all the ad placements they get 
And instead of running their algorithm, which is what's placing the ads and actually making them money, um, what they were doing is they were taking 1% of these and they were allowing the people in the labs, you know, the research part, to, um, to experiment with this and to try and place ads and to take surveys of the types of interactions they were having and doing extra effects. And, but this was only a sample of their population, a sample of all the things they got to do. Because they didn't want to stop running their algorithm which was making them money on the other part. So they only got a subset. So, so we're studying how accurate these subsets is, is, you know, is, is a, you know, has actual practical importance. Um, so, and if you just looked at a sample and you said, I have this many samples, then you can back and solve for the value of epsilon, any customer base of probability epsilon, then, then I can understand that I've, I've hit that customer base. But I don't necessarily have the right, you know, proportion of customers in that category. So now the question is, how do I get, you know, the right proportion of customers? right um, proportion of, uh, of the uh, uh, um, of the domain. And so this will be something that is, is going to work even if there's not some, some even distribution here. So here I'm assuming that each, each bucket I'm drawing evenly from. But this will work if, if there's actually a different distribution of the birthdays, right? So, so, let's, so if you look at, um, at, at people, playing, um, uh, uh, um, people playing pro hockey, um, for instance. Uh, um, so it, so um, right now there's no one playing pro hockey, actually. A lot, or maybe it starts up this weekend again, I forget which. But, um, but there's this very skewed distribution where there are a lot more people who are born on a certain month because there's a big advantage to being larger than playing hockey. And so the people who were able to enter the league and be 11 months older than someone else in the league had a size advantage and they gained more, more confidence. And so and it, this ended up percolating all the way up to the NHL who stayed in hockey and who did this. So there's a weird age distrib distribution of the months um, in the NHL based on where the cutoff was for the initial leagues that you were in. Um, so if we're trying to understand this distribution, we want to do this from a sample. Okay, so how do we measure the right proportion of this domain? Right, so, um, so one of the techniques um, um, well, so Um, so, so let's let's try and, and do this. Let's say that fi is equal to the number of of, of trials um, um, that um, that draw i um, for, um, for some i in this domain, right? So let's let fi be this number of trials, right? And so then we want to say that. The, the true number, the expected number of trials here, right? The expected number of trials, fi is going to be k over n. So if we draw k trials total and they're n buckets, we expect this, this number k over n trials to be in the, in the, in the bucket. Um, and so then one way we can measure how close we are to the right proportion is to say something like um, WK is going to be the, the max over all values I of, of F of I minus the expected value, K over N, right? So, so, so if I'm more accurate, then this number should get closer, right? Uh, but what's going to happen as What's going to happen as I draw more on more samples? Is this eventually going to converge to zero, where I have less error? That's the correct expansion value. Right. Well, 
Um, that's actually not true. So actually, if you take this, it's not going to converge. This is not going to converge to zero. What's going to happen is that, um, so, um, um, so if you look at this at this thing from the coupon collectors, it's I'm going to need about um, so n log n things to get one thing in each of the bits, right? So, um, so that means that if I have if k is equal to n log n, I'm going to have um, something here which is is going to be I'll probably have something here which is zero and something here which is going to be um, so. This, Zero minus k over n, and something else which is going to be um, um, something else here which is going to be log n, right? If I have the total thing is n log n, then I have at least one bin which is log n, right? So I have one thing which is log n, and and what's going to happen is that um, so um, as k increases, this difference is going to keep growing. So you're going to have this essentially. Um, the you're, you're always going to have some outliers when you do this. Um, so um, what you're going to want to do instead is something slightly different. Um, so that, um, is that you're going to want to look at something let's call this zk, where this is going to be the max. Um, max over i of um, let's call this f i um, tilde instead minus um, minus one over n, where where this f i f i tilde is going to be equal to um, f i um, f i over k. So with this. This is not the number of trials, it's the fraction of trials which fall into this bin. And so this is the expected fraction of trials in the bin, or n bits. Um, and so then, um, so, this, so then zk has a nice property that as, as n, as, as k increases, this term is, um, then this term is, um, um, then this term is going to go to zero, right? So if you look at the fraction of things instead of the absolute value, then this will converge. Um, and so then, once we have this this difference, and, and and I'll go through a little bit of analysis and and explain. It'll be more clear later why this wk does not go to zero, but this zk does go to zero. So once I Kind of, I'll, I'll need some more machinery and more definitions to show you. So I'll delay, I'll, I'll delay, explain why this is true a little bit. Um, um, but then once we have this, we can say something like, um, we want, uh, let's say, if zk is less than epsilon, so that means that every of every one of the bins has within an epsilon probability. Um, the right um, fraction of things in it. Um, so it's the right. So, so, so this is um, this is going to be the the um, the empirical estimate of the number of customers we have, and this is the right proportion, right? So if the empirical estimate and uh, the true probability of having a customer of this type is within some value epsilon for all bins, then we say that um, the um, we have an um, an epsilon sample, and and I'll actually later I'll make this definition a bit more general to be more than just this thing with bits here. But so so if we always have the proportions within epsilon, then we say this is an epsilon sample. And so then we can ask how big does k need to be for this to be an epsilon sample? And the cool thing is that the size of k will not depend on, on n. Um, so, so, usually, so usually epsilon 
is is going to be a small small number. Um, so it, it could be like um, like 0.1, which is 10%, or so every bin is within 10% correct, or um, one option, or, or if we do this uh, 0 0.001, then this is this is 10 percent. This is 0 0.1 percent. So, um, so and and I'll jump to the the chase. The answer is going to be we're going to need k to be about one over epsilon squared. So that means if you want 10 percent error, we're going to need about about 100 samples. And if we want um, and if we're going to want one tenth, uh, one tenth of one percent error, then we're going to need. Um, I think this is going to be a million samples, so it's going to be pretty big. So, um, so if is it, um, what? No, a million samples total. So, if if you have if you have have a lot of bins, then. Um, Um, and what's going to happen is that you may have some empty bins, um, but if you have, if, but then this, uh, um, but if you really have a lot of bins, then you, it's such that you have empty bins, this one over n is going to be less than this threshold, right? Because you know you need about a thousand times log of a thousand draws to get no empty bins. And you're going to have a thousand times a thousand draws total, right? So you, so, so you, you, you probably won't have any. You, so I guess you probably won't have. So if n is so large, you have empty bins. It means that this one over n is really small, and so you're going to be okay. The problem will be the bins where you have one sample. Even those will be a problem because um, one over some k less than n may be too large, and so the k will need to be this big in order to drive it down. Yeah. Wait, so are we letting k and n both go to infinity in moments? What? Are we letting k and n both go to infinity when we take No, n's, n's going to be fixed. Okay. Um, but you can make, you can kind of let n go to infinity. You can let n, you can let the domain be continuous. Think of like all birthdays up to, you know, the exact time, more than milliseconds, right? So you could, you could think of that way, and then n is, is continuous, and this will still work. Um, you need to go back to these these nice categories like these intervals instead of the buckets. Um, yes, sir. So if I is a random variable, so uh, so you can of course you cannot one hundred percent sure to make a z no matter how big k is. You right. cannot one make one hundred percent sure to make the z uh, to smaller than sensing. Yeah. So in terms of what probability you are talking about? Right. Um, good. Um, that's a really good point. So I, I, I left off some um, some details. There's one over epsilon squared times log of one over delta, and this is um, um, correct with with probability greater or equal one minus delta. So there's means some delta probability of failure that we're going to have here. And this will add an extra log over delta. Um, this term is is going to be pretty minor. If you go to one over a million chance of having more error than you said you were, then this number is going to be something like this log number is going to be like 13 or something. Like that. It's actually a log base n. Um, or I mean a log a log base e natural log. Um, yeah. Okay. So I will. I'm going, to, I'm going to explain this in. I'm going to come back and explain this in a little more, um, um, in a little bit more detail um, um, later. Um, so, but um, before I do that, I kind of want to. Um, I, I, I kind of want to. Like make clear what what the main point is again, right? So the, the, the main point is if you have a domain um, of size n, you know you get the square root n steps when you have a collision when things intersect, 
And then when you do the coupon collectors, when you hit everything, this is you get the next login factor. And it's really better to think about this as hitting every small but nice set. And you need this one over epsilon log over epsilon. And then to get things so they're even, you need about one over epsilon squared. And this turns out to be a pretty big number. Um, to actually guarantee this, you're going to um, need you, you, you're going to need a lot of um, you're actually going to need a lot of samples, right? So this is why, um, for instance, why there, if you look at polls um, dur during the election, they they say there's something like a like they'll say like a three or four percent uh, um, margin of error, and it's not calculated this way. They probably should calculate it some some way closer to this. Um, but it's because they typically have about two or three thousand people in 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 every poll. If you see a poll less than two or three thousand people, like of uh, of three hundred people, a poll of three hundred people, you're probably going to have error on the order of. Um, if k is equal to 300, then about what is the value of epsilon here, right? It's going to be about um, um, something like seven or eight percent, right? A seven or eight percent margin of error in the race for who is the president is a huge margin, right? That doesn't tell you anything, right? So you really need to get up to three or four thousand or two or three thousand to really get something meaningful to get down to about two or three percent error. And, and this is really kind of kind of the reason why, because of this one over epsilon squared um, factor here. This epsilon is kind of area here. So so th th so that would work in in the case if you were voting between two people, you want to know who is more. Then n would be two. You'd have two buckets. You're trying to estimate what is the proportion in one bucket versus the proportion in the other bucket. Either you know this was Obama and, and Romney, right? And if you only had um, 300 people who you, you poll, then you may be off by about 7% error in these, in these proportions, is one way of seeing this. Um, okay. Um, so, um, yeah, th this, I'll, I'll just add a I guess I have a couple of notes I want to say before I move on. We can also, if each bin here has a true probability instead of one over n, the same sampling uh, uh, mechanism works. You still need, you're still going to need about this many samples to get air defined this way, where there's some other unknown probability here. Um, and 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 as as I mentioned, you can think of there being some. Some um, some continuous distribution in, instead here, right? So let's say that it's 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 like it's like the hockey players' distribution, and there's uh, some skewed distribution of these buckets, right? So so maybe if, if there are buckets here, um, so so instead of looking at the if there's some continuous values, this was all the birthdays up to the you know past the millisecond, um, and then you could ask for any any interval um, query that had at least an, an epsilon, um, so at least an epsilon fraction of the mass that you cared about. If if you looked at some some region in here that was a really small region that only correspond to say one day, and you want to know how well did I estimate the fraction in, in one day of this distribution, and and I set my epsilon to be 1 over 100, but this one day was an average day, so it was 1 over 365 was this average. Then, then even before I take any samples, I already have, have a good estimate of this day, because my estimate is zero. And, and I'm, I'm automatically going to do good by getting zero samples. Um, I might accidentally get one sample, um, and but if I do, you know, one over epsilon squared samples, I'm going to get proportionally the right number. So even if I don't hit that bucket, it's okay. So the really small kind of questions I would ask are very easy to estimate under under this measure because then this pi is really small. Um, right. 
Um, okay, so so I'll come back and describe this this a bit more generally at the end. But the, the next thing I want to do, which is is uh, kind of um, which is interesting in yeah. So you, so you say that even if the uh, probability of the bins is variable, that you still use the one over n. No, no. You, you want to you want to measure the error with the true probability. So this this pi is going to be the um, true um, probability of event i. And so I want to I want to measure how much error I have versus the true probability. Now, now, ahead of time, if I'm estimating with the samples, I don't know what this true probability is. Um, but I can, the, the, the kind of, using the analysis, you can say I'm going to be, I'm going to be within epsilon close with probability at least one minus delta. So this is known as, as, um, as the pack, uh, um, it's the pack framework, or um, probably, um, approximately um, correct. So probably approximately correct. So this is the, I'm probably correct. I'm delta one minus delta probably correct. But I'm only approximately correct. I'm only correct within epsilon. So I don't have the right value pi, but I'm prop delta probably epsilon approximately correct. So this is the PACT framework, and a lot of like analysis of machine learning algorithms work this way because you can't, if you're using random samples from data, you can't guarantee to be correct. You might, you might draw a really weird sample, and you're never going to have the exact answer, so you're only going to get approximately correct. So it looks complicated with all these epsilons and deltas, but you actually need these to do the analysis correctly. Otherwise, your analysis isn't, isn't quite right, or it's you're leaving out some details. Um, but this delta, this delta term doesn't matter so much. So this will be very small compared to the epsilon term. So the key part is the epsilon. OK. Um, all right, so, so the next thing I'm going to talk about are how to, how to think about analyzing this, this approach here. How to, how to analyze how much error I have, how to get these epsilon delta errors. And so I'm going to go through something, you know, a technical thing uh, um, called Chernoff optic bounds, right? And, and so it's kind of a technical tool, and it's a way of bounding the probability. Um, but it's also